Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for coming here today. My name is Kurt Volker. I have the honor of working with Cindy McCain and others in the McCain world and the Arizona State University world as the executive director of the McCain Institute. Uh, the McCain Institute was founded about four years ago with the explicit goal of being an action-oriented do tank as opposed to a think tank. The challenge that we set for ourselves was to not figure out what we could recommend that somebody else do, but what we could take on and make a difference in ourselves. And, and that was the ethos that was built. And it was built on a, a presumption of promoting values and character and promoting character-driven leadership, that each of us can exercise leadership and take responsibility and bring about change in our world, in our societies. Probably no program that we have launched at the McCain Institute has better exemplified that spirit of taking action and making a difference than the human trafficking work that we have done, uh, led by Cindy McCain and her work as the chairperson of our um, Human Trafficking Advisory Council, and her personal work as the co-chair of the Governor of Arizona's Task Force on Human Trafficking, and a number of other uh, events and activities she has taken on around the country and internationally. Uh, as an uh, institute, we have tried to think holistically about the problem of human trafficking and what we can do about it. We have done a lot of work in the area of public awareness and awareness raising, and I'll come back to that. We've also sponsored original research just to improve some of the data that we have about human trafficking. We've examined some of the patterns, such as whether large uh, public events such as the Super Bowl become a magnet for traffickers and how you can identify that. We've looked at the way the internet is used, both open internet and dark internet, in order to uh, advertise for sex services and to sell the, the services of minors uh, through the internet, and then how that can be turned back against traffickers by empowering them through technology and software, and, and, or empowering law enforcement through technology and software so they can do a better job of finding patterns and tracking them down. That's something we've done in partnership with another NGO called Thorn, uh, which has developed software that does exactly that for law enforcement. We provided uh, training for law enforcement and social services personnel. We've done targeted awareness raising. We've created a student alliance against trafficking at universities in Arizona, and that is soon going nationwide. Uh, we have worked with Native American communities that are particular victims uh, of human trafficking. There's a wide array of things that we have tried to do where we have felt that we can make a direct impact, a direct difference. And I honestly believe that we have. But probably the most significant thing, as simple as it seems, is simply raising public awareness. Because when we started this about four years ago, and Cindy will back me up on this, there was a perception that this isn't a problem or not a big one. And even if it is a problem, well, what do you do about it? And I think after four years, that perception is radically different, that there is a widespread perception that it is a problem. There is a uniform, universal intolerance for human trafficking. No one would be lenient on this or, or condone this or look the other way anymore. And there is a whole menu of things, specific things, that can and should be done to combat it that people are in favor of. And we've seen that uh, many, many ways time and again. Uh, one of the principal ways we've done the public awareness raising has been Cindy McCain's own efforts, a conversation series with people who've been active in a fight against trafficking that we can shine a spotlight on uh, in order to highlight the work that they're doing and make people more aware what the problem is and what some of the solutions are. Uh, we've had a series of Leadership Voices conversations which uh, focus people on their own leadership activities. What can an individual do? Uh, we've done billboard advertising. We've put advertising on the light rail between Tempe and Phoenix in Arizona. Anything we can think of that is going to make a difference, and I think we really have. Uh, one of the people who has made a difference on this is with us today to introduce the first panel, and that is Senator Heidi Heitkamp. And she and Cindy McCain and Senator Klobuchar, who is here this morning, have traveled together, have highlighted this issue together. She sponsored legislation. They've held hearings. They have drilled down deeply on this issue to try to find ways through legislation to empower law enforcement, to empower intelligence collection, to empower social services, and to protect victims. Uh, and one of the first steps, and you'll hear this throughout the discussions today, is to make sure that victims are indeed treated as victims and not as criminals themselves. 
Uh, so with that, and to introduce our first panel, we have a um, distinguished senator here with us, Senator Heidi Heitkamp. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon, and thank you uh, in particular to the McCain Institute. Um, they have, uh, through Cindy's leadership, absolutely been the premier uh, nonprofit NGO um, think tank and emotional mover on this issue of human slavery, of human trafficking. And um, I, I tell a couple stories, I guess, um, just to give you by way of background. I'm a former attorney general. And as Attorney General, I had the Bureau of Criminal Investigation under my jurisdiction. We did a lot of law enforcement work. But I became Attorney General in 1992. And in 1992, no one really believed, if you can imagine this, that domestic violence was a crime. In fact, most domestic violence programs were housed in public health. This was a public health problem. This was a family law problem. This was a problem that needed counseling and not incarceration. Um, an amazing thing happened in a just a little fit of um, go women um, into public office. A number of women got elected attorney general and uh, attorneys general, and across the country, um, unbeknownst to all of us, we started saying something that was novel at the time, which is when there is violence in the family, there's violence against society, and it needs to be prosecuted. And if we're going to prevent violence, those names need to be in the paper and they need to be charged. We need to expose the victimization. We need to expose this as what for what it is, which is aggravated assault. And in my state, um, uh, at least 50% of all homicides were a result of domestic violence, um, the consequences of domestic violence. So we, so, so we started talking about it. We started talking about violence in the family. And we started saying things need to change. And I was a crusader. Um, for a couple personal reasons that involved a case that I took pro bono. But, you know, I just went out. And my job was to educate law enforcement. And I remember one of my first tours around the state of North Dakota. I was in, in my home community, my home county, um, and I was meeting with a number of um, law enforcement officials. And I said, you know, this is a crime. We can't allow this to happen. We have got to change how we look at family violence and violence against women and children. And this old police officer came up to me after um, my discussion, and he literally put his finger in my face, and I was a lot younger then. And he said, listen here, girly. Men will always beat their wives, and you can't stop them. And I thought, what do you say to that? And then I said something pretty simple. I said, you might be right. I sure hope you're not right, but you might be right. But I said, the one thing I do know we cannot live in a world where we don't try. Because that's failure. That is conceding. That is giving up. And we cannot give up. We cannot give up when the consequences of violence, the consequences of, of victimization, the consequences of something as horrific as these crimes has such dire and serious consequences for all of us. We are all diminished. We are all diminished when we do not tackle this problem, and when we accept a culture of failure, when we say we just can't see any way that we can stop this kind of violence. I'll tell you one, one other story before I introduce the panel, and it involves our work um, with uh, Prevent Child Abuse North Dakota. Um, we, we were trying to find some way to educate legislators who are responsible in large measure for appropriations on what we could do to help them understand um, violence uh, against children. And so I had this idea, or somebody in our group had this idea, that we would do like the Holocaust Museum. We would get a pair of children's shoes for every child that had been where there had been an indicated report of child abuse and neglect. Not reported, but an indicated report, which meant there was suspicion that this was true. And we would, we would put these shoes into the Great Hall in, at the state capitol. And we would, we would, you know, demonstrate the impact and the number of children who every day suffered um, uh, as victims of uh, sexual assault and violence in, and neglect. So we got all these shoes together, and you know, there was there was a lot of them. I think there was maybe a thousand, which in our state is huge. And you know, you translate a given population, huge. And 
these legislators would come by and they would say, what is this? And I would explain, because I sat out there, I would explain, well, these are the, he goes, you mean in the country? And I said, no, in our state of North Dakota. And they go, well, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. It's too horrific for people to look. When they look, they have to see, and they have to believe, and they have to then do what you're all doing here, do what we're trying to do in this country, which is take responsibility as a society to change, to take responsibility for the change that we know needs to come. And when we all take that responsibility, when we all stand up in communities and tell men, honestly, mainly men, you cannot buy small children and get by with it. Just like that family abuser all of a sudden had the risk of losing his job. If you're, if you're going to buy small children, you're going to be charged with a crime because it is what Cindy said it is. It is sexual assault against a minor, which is a crime in every state in this country. And it doesn't matter if he paid anyone. It doesn't matter. I mean, it, just to give you a sense of what's happening in my home state, um, I went around the state and law enforcement, which I'm familiar with because I was the attorney general, kept saying, Heidi, you just can't believe the amount of prostitution. We're just seeing it everywhere. And we just don't have time to investigate. So I thought about that and I started researching and I started talking to people and I started understanding that what we had known as prostitution had a much hor more horrific side. It's not just children. Many of the women who now are stuck in this lifestyle began as children. They're entitled to the same amount of respect. We have to get over this distinction between minors and adults because when you interview women, you'll find out their life pattern and their life trajectory. And it wasn't, uh, it, they didn't begin this at age 18 or 21. This began much earlier for many of these women. And, and so when you, when you look, at, look at what's happening in communities, and you, 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 the, the law enforcement started getting involved, BCI did, and BCI did a sting in Dickinson, North Dakota. Dickinson you know, is, a, is a larger community than what it was a couple years ago because it's on the edge of the Bakken oil development. And um, they did a sting and they advertised 14-year-old kids. And they had to stop the sting because the jail was full. And they got two calls from two people who said, couldn't you make it a 12-year-old? Now, what I want to tell you from that story is when men tell you, I didn't know, of course they knew. Of course they knew. It, it defies imagination. They know exactly what they're doing. Backpages knows exactly what they're doing. And they're skirting and hiding behind a precious liberty that we have, which is the First Amendment, and we can't let them. We cannot let people hide behind our constitutional liberties so that they can do evil to children and women and our society. And so I want to want to um, now introduce this wonderful panel. And um, you know, every once in a while in life, you find someone who inspires you, someone who 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 just has the same amount of passion, um, has the same amount of, of vision, and has the same amount of optimism that society can change. And that person for me is Cindy McCain. You know, we talk about the most horrific thing that happens in America, but yet we remain optimistic because we know what's in every one of your hearts. We know that if we can reach your hearts, if she can reach out to every one of you and, and, and challenge you to do better, that we can all be better as a society. And then we also want to um, introduce Mr. Clark, who's with the National Missing and Exploited Children, um, which um, uh, very, very dear and near to my heart. I worked very closely with your organization when I was Attorney General. And um, just to, just to um, give you a shout out, last piece of introduction, um, you guys have rescued more children from this horrific challenge than anyone else in the world. We would love to take your organization, duplicate it, spread it near and far across the world, and you only need to tell us what you need us to do to help you to do that. And so you are going to just be inspired. You're going to be horrified by the next panel. But hopefully you'll leave here with the same amount of optimism that I have, because two really good people believe we can change the world. Thank you. Can you come forward?
Heidi Heitkamp is the only person that I know of could get, that could get me into steel-toed boots <laughs> on oil well, and she did. <laughs> I went up to visit her in uh, North Dakota, and she took me on an amazing tour of the oil patch and uh, Indian country, and uh, it was very, uh, it, it, it was eye-opening, and it was also a precious honor to be able to, to travel with and enjoy the company of someone who is impassioned about this this subject as we are. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Um, we, I am so excited to have you here today, Mr. Clark. You are an inspiration to all of us. And you're, you're, I was reading your bio. Um, and you have, you have such a vast understanding from the work that you have done. I'd first like to, to ask you to tell us, I want you to tell us a little bit about yourself and how this evolution has gotten you to NICMIC, if you wouldn't mind. And Absolutely. welcome, and thank you for doing this. Thank you, yeah. Well, uh, yes, good afternoon, everybody. And I, I certainly want to thank you as well, McCain Institute, for having me here. Uh, it's always nice to be in a room full of fighters, uh, people who are engaged in uh, learning more about this is one of the most, I think, most important topics of our time. Uh, so I congratulate you in putting this, uh, this idea of, uh, of public awareness on this forum together. Um, well, as was noted, I've had uh, about a 36-year uh, service of, uh, in government and uh, in the corporate world. Uh, but it wasn't until really the last three months uh, when I joined the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, December the 7th, I've been here three months, not even quite, uh, that I really uh, found, uh, uh, I guess I'd call it a home. Uh, you know, during my Marshall Service career, a great organization going back to 1789 when George Washington appointed the very first Marshals to the present day, uh, one of those core duties that the Marshals uh, handle, of course, is the apprehension of uh, very dangerous criminals and fugitives, just like the days of old. Uh, so rather remarkably and somewhat ironically, uh, I'm sitting here on the stage as somebody who, uh, when I had darker hair and was a few pounds lighter, <laughs> Uh, actually arrested uh, sex offenders and those who had been involved in very uh, uh, serious crimes. Uh, but uh, moving forward now at the National Center for the Missing and Exploited Children, uh, I had this great opportunity to start shaping public policy, uh, shaping awareness. And uh, you know when you have what I call the alarm clock test every, every morning when you get up and you say, where am I going to work? Uh, what's the purpose of me going there? And I can tell you right now, uh, every single day, and I don't believe this is going to change for me, I'm, uh, I'm energized, invigorated, and ready to come to work because I know that this is a very, very important uh, task to find the missing and stop exploitation. And so that's, uh, that's the kind of the joy I have when I go to work every day. And uh, so I'm very, very honored and privileged to work in an organization like that. Well, thank you. Um... Heidi mentioned something that I thought was is very much a part of the, I know that we all talk about but for the for people that don't work in this on a daily basis is the tragedy of what's what happens and the the evil dark side that we tend to see yes. and why we keep doing this how we keep doing it uh, can we be doing it better um, Nick Mick has been such a leader on all of this so I guess what I'm asking you is, is I'd like to to hear from you um, the good things that are going on right now. We know the, the bad things, but I'd like to hear where your progress is at, and I know that you have lots of plans coming up too. A little birdie told me that. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, uh, you know, about a 32 year history, uh, as you may know, the organization developed sort of in a grassroots uh, uh, process when, uh, when John Walsh from America's Most Wanted fame and uh, his son uh, Adam was murdered, and that whole process of going through to be uh, the voice and the advocate for uh, uh, similar circumstances now, of course, we're missing and exploited as well. Uh, so the, the history is, is relatively rich and deep, but the focus has been primarily on, uh, on being that voice and that advocate to the present day uh, for those who are missing and those who are being exploited. But on the, um, the sex trafficking issue, those who are being exploited or the child pornography and all the other really uh, sort of dark uh, things yeah. that happen, uh, you can only uh, uh, imagine, I guess, is, is in fact, it's hard to imagine, uh, to even get your hands around the scope uh, of what's happening. Uh, you know, in the days of old where 
uh, somebody would have to uh, drive to a certain part of town perhaps to find uh, uh, some type of uh, illicit sexual liaison. Uh, technology today, while it's been a, a, a blessing for us, uh, has also found a, a way to enable uh, human trafficking and sex trafficking at such a, a pace and such a level that it's very, very difficult to keep up with. So we're looking at uh, you know, strong partnerships uh, with technology organizations to find out how we can better uh, combat this particular problem uh, in, in terms of stopping the exploitation. Uh, we look for forums like this. Uh, education and awareness is extremely important. Uh, as was noted by the senator, uh, that you know, the more people know about it and the more involved they become in our present day, uh, the, the better that is. So the National Center wants to be uh, that place where uh, uh, anybody can come to find the right resources to get involved in this issue. So public awareness, very, very uh, important, and that's one of my uh, key objectives as well. The partnership side, you know, we're working with law enforcement at all levels. Uh, federal, state, and local. Very, very uh, uh, important to us to partner with them. So on all these different plateaus, uh, we're trying to uh, be true difference makers when it comes to stopping exploitation mm -hmm. and particularly the, uh, the trafficking of, uh, of young minor children. You mentioned something uh, <clears throat> just, just now about the, the web and then the other web, the dark web. Um, I don't know about you, but when I thought I knew what the web was, you know, I do have my emails and I go on Google and all the other things that we do. And then it was explained to me by a very wonderful young man, Ashton Kircher, what the dark web was. And, you know, that, that moment of elation, I think, oh, we might be able to get our hands on the web. We can start tracking things. And then all of a sudden I realized we're nowhere near being able to fix this because of this, this other element in this. How do we, aside from using every tool we have with national security interests and, and how can we as a country help curb the dark web, or can we? Or is this just something we're gonna to have to, to learn to, to work around? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, public policy debate because on the one hand, uh, you know, we want the freedoms we all enjoy to be able to communicate with the devices that we have and use the, uh, the web for uh, the good intended purposes that we all use it for. Uh, but on the, uh, the dark side or the bad side of that, of course, the web is used to uh, traffic in, in minor children. Uh, I mean, imagine for a second that, uh, again, you can take uh, an iPhone and look through ads through the dark web or through other uh, illicit uh, sites and uh, in order, uh, like you would order a pizza, for example, uh, a minor child uh, that would be um, of a certain uh, type or one that, that, that an individual would say they desire, and have that child delivered to the very spot where you want them to be delivered. Again, almost like ordering a pizza. pizza yeah. And so you think about the, the horrific uh, uh, bad side, if you will, of the web where that can be done. So it's making it very, very difficult <clears throat> for, um, for law enforcement uh, or to put public policy around this or, or to actually being able to, uh, to track those types of offenders. And so there, there is some difficulty in, uh, for sure in doing that. But I would look forward to, uh, in our organization, is working with uh, members of Congress and others to try to find a good way to combat that. I, I, this occurred to me this morning when I was listening to the news. Uh, the whole iPhone issue, whether we break the codes, get the codes, whatever it may be, that's not what this discussion is about. But the ability to, to um, the ease that you talked about, about being able to pull a child, you know, order a child online on, my phone, on your phone or, or something similar to that, it is of concern. So how do you, where do, where do our, our rights, you know, our, the, the rights that our Constitution gave us and, and the rights of these children, on the other hand, come into play? How do we balance that? Sure, you know, and I think parents want their uh, children to grow up in a, in a, uh, in a way that is like, like most typical uh, children, to be able to enjoy, uh, you know, having the friends they want to have and using uh, the computer and uh, the, the web and talking on cell phones and all those kinds of things that youngsters do these days. Uh, at the same time, it starts early in their age, I think, with some awareness level, too, about making sure that, uh, you know, young children understand uh, that there are certainly some, uh, some hazards and dangers on, on the web. 
<clears throat> in, in addition to that, when you talk about the freedoms of, uh, you know, like when you're talking with members of Congress and others about how we can actually uh, find the right public policy to protect our children right. so that they're not using that uh, in, a, in a way it's going to be harmful to them, uh, but at the same time allowing them to have these freedoms. So we're working very hard on uh, good education and prevention campaigns. You know, we, we want parents, we tell parents, uh, be aware of what uh, your child is doing uh, when they're surfing on the web. Uh, we have a whole uh, educational program we have in all 50 states now, uh, working in schools to educate the young children uh, and as well as parents about you know, how they can use technology in a good and productive and safe way. Right, yeah. Um, I'm actually very grateful. Mine are all grown now, and we were just, as teenagers, just getting into the Internet a little bit. I mean, so I, as a mother, uh, I'm just so grateful I didn't have to deal with that portion of it. Um, our problem, at least in our neighborhood where we were at, was the parent that didn't believe it was a problem. And so the, I'm sure you all have, have encountered some of this, the, the, the kid that sent the picture, you know, that winds up with all of his friends and then I see it and the parent says, well, my kid would never do that, but it, can't, it has his address, you know, their home computer address on it. Um, it's, that's, and my point being in, in all of this is making parents understand this really is a problem and to be not only active, but to be proactive on it. And I find, at least in my dealings out west, it's a little difficult to sometimes make parents understand. That's a very My kid wouldn't do that, you know, kind of thing. Well, uh, denial will not get you anywhere in this <laughs> particular thing. And I think uh, many parents probably do want to believe their children, uh, you know, wear halos over their head and they're perfect angels all the time. Uh, and again, with the, you take the vulnerability of young mm -hmm. children. Yeah. Uh, and we know, for example, that uh, many of those who end up being trafficked in, uh, in minor uh, sex trafficking uh, are runaways. They're, they're individuals who, uh, you know, for some type of a, a circumstantial thing at home are having some difficulties and uh, they become vulnerable. Then they're, uh, they're prime targets and they become prime targets to being lured and enticed by those who are going to traffic uh, that child. And so, you know, going back through all, again, all the technology pieces and how that that can happen, uh, it begins, again, with good parental awareness and understanding, uh, you know, that, that child and what they're doing, who they're hanging with. Right, yeah. Uh, um, my favorite subject, Backpage. Um, can we talk about Backpage a little bit? Um, the most recent activities of Backpage in that they defied a subpoena in, to come in front of a, a Senate committee is mind-boggling that they wouldn't show up. Not surprising, though. Sure. Uh, I, I, I know that they are owned by someone else now. They were originally headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona. The two men that owned it live in my neighborhood. And quite frankly, they pass themselves off as decent human beings, and I find it my husband has to remind me to behave myself at home. So <laughs> anyway, um, what do we do? How do we combat uh, an or organizations like Backpage and others that are wholesale selling our children and saying, no, we check, we know they're old enough. We have a, a paper here that says they're old enough. Oh, sure. And in fact, uh, that public policy uh, debate is now ongoing, and it's a good one to have. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, Senator Heitkamp, with, uh, with a hearing just right. recently, right, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, which I was able to attend, was able to uh, really start focusing the spotlight on this organization Backpage and others that are out there uh, that will hide behind uh, the veil of our, of our uh, Constitution and our right to free speech to say that they can put an ad on a website uh, that, that uh, purports to show uh, an individual without maybe any attribution or, or discussion about what age that person is, uh, but clearly are trafficking and helping to traffic in minor children uh, for sex. And so when you boil all that down and you start to look at how that's happening, uh, the, again, the public policy debate needs to happen now. Uh, we cannot, uh, I don't think as a society, as a, as a culture, as a people, allow this to continue. If, again, going back to my example a moment ago, through ads and uh, uh, individuals being able to to find uh, young children to be able to uh, to buy them for sexual 
uh, their own sexual desires like you would go uh, on any other type of ad to buy a car. Uh, there's, there's a true distinction there that somehow in the conscience of our country we have to come to grips with. Uh, so I am very pleased to say part of that's already in motion. You know, we are, we are tackling that very, very strongly. Uh, we are making some effort right now to work with uh, Congress to find some, uh, some really good, uh, I would even call them good strong arm tactics to get this kind of stuff to stop. Because, you know, if, if you don't have um, uh, an effort and an energy and a zeal to do something as much as like you're doing now with, with the McCain Institute, to highlight and focus on it, nothing's going to change. Uh, I, I honestly believe, and, and we all know it, right? There's nothing that will really change. So it starts with a, with a movement and an effort uh, to try to change that whole uh, uh, legal issue uh, and to get them to understand that they can't hide behind uh, the veil of just saying it's a constitutional right to be able to put it up an ad with a young child on it. Does this include the, the um, <coughs> Communications Decency Act? Is that somehow involved in this, a it, change in that? or? That's true, and I, and I think they're looking at all the different particulars yeah. of how, you know, the, the, the laws and communication right now that could be used, again, for legitimate yeah. reasons, but the ones where, you know, we know that there's criminal activity. I mean, if you were putting up an ad to sell, uh, you, know, um, you know, large quantities of heroin, uh, somebody would yeah. probably, you know, pull you aside and arrest you and you'd go to jail. Uh, so similarly saying, that, you know, you just can't say, anything goes on the World Wide Web, anything goes in an ad uh, is, is insane. That's, that is absolutely not true. Uh, so uh, th there is a line of demarcation, and I'm, I am very grateful that, uh, that Congress now, and, and the, they're really taking a more passionate look at it. I think they made a, a very, on a personal note, I think they made a very serious mistake by standing Heidi Heitkamp up, Senator Heitkamp. <laughs> I think she's after him now. I'm happy to say, <laughs> right, guys? <laughs> um, can you tell me uh, how how your efforts in in helping to combat human trafficking and uh, protect these children, save these children, has changed over the past ten years? Yes, I I can say that uh, right now with our partnerships with a lot of the uh, the technology giants has helped us. Uh, it's helping us as a nation. I think. Uh, being able to find the right hashtags on pictures and being able to uh, use the strengths of uh, the technology giants to be able to partner with us so that when online uh, predators or uh, sex trafficking, those types of things that are being done through the technology means are, uh, are working now better than they were uh, 10 years ago, for example. Uh, there's a lot more education and awareness going on now. Uh, as was noted in the opening it's a perfect comments. perfect storm right now. On yes, I, I mean, really, that's a fabulous thing in itself. Uh, you know, the old um, uh, current actually uh, saying in Homeland Security, if you see something, you know, say something. And that is true uh, now in this sit uh, situation as well. Uh, because, again, denying that there's, uh, there's not human trafficking happening or child sex trafficking happening uh, in your area. Uh, I can tell you, I, I don't drive by a truck stop anymore and think of it in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm in a shopping mall and, uh, you know, years of old where it might have been quite safe to have children there by themselves, mm -mm. Uh, whenever I see those kind of play areas where children are there, those are magnets for pedophiles and others. Uh, so, you know, you have to start to think. In ten, ten years ago, maybe it wasn't quite as unsafe, but now... And we see plenty of examples in everyday news of young children that go missing, young children that are harmed. Sadly, some uh, they either are not found or, uh, or end up uh, uh, being found, but being found dead. Uh, so it, it breaks your heart, it's a, and it's an issue that from, said, 10 years ago or many years ago. So the National Center, we're trying to be on the forefront of all these issues. How can we raise awareness? How can we train children early? How can we get parents involved? You know, how can we shape public policy? Uh, how can we work with technology giants to make uh, things better for safe surfing on the, on the internet? How can we work with law enforcement to, uh, uh, to do things and to, to crack down on those who are going to be uh, trafficking children? Uh, so it's, it's a battle on literally all kinds of fronts. 
Well, I, it, one of the, the areas, obviously, that the McCain Institute is beginning to focus on a little bit is human trafficking outside our own borders. And uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, because I know NICMIC and, uh, uh, and other organizations, ICMIC and all of them have been, are involved, heavily involved offshore on trying to combat some of this. Um, tell me, I guess tell me what the progress is and where you see this going. Can we do it? Can we make this a worldwide effort that's actually conceived and actually workable uh, on this? Or are we really just kind of building, building a few blocks at a time, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, it's a great question. In fact, uh, we are working very well and, uh, and making advancements all the time with our uh, international partners. We work very closely with the, uh, the International Center for Missing Exploited Children. Uh, in fact, this afternoon, uh, the senior officials from the German uh, federal police are coming to the National Center to partner and talk with us about these very issues of, of, of uh, uh, child sex trafficking and exploitation and, and all that. Uh, and we have a, a whole network through our cyber tip line of, of capabilities to be able to uh, share information, sharing reports. We're working very closely with Interpol, very closely with Europol, a number of organizations internationally to focus on it as well because while the problem is is uh, quite pronounced here in the United States uh, internationally it is uh, a, a very very difficult as well and hard to keep uh, uh, certain you know controls on it there uh, primarily because many nations have um, uh, very few or very ineffective laws believe it or not when it comes to this or they're not enforced or they're not enforced so you look at it from an international perspective, uh, you're only really as effective or as good as that, that government and those policing authorities or, or authorities generally would want to combat it and help do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're always advocating and trying to work with our uh, uh, a more formidable partners such as the German police yeah. and others who come by to visit us so that we can get that message out there uh, to them. Is the, it, it just by by chance, are the German police coming in because of the refugee push that's, that's entered Germany? Is this part of the trafficking issue? Uh, I, I don't know if that's, that's strictly the issue. I, I think uh, they've been actually visited us a, a couple years ago, mm -hmm. and I think it's, it's more from their, their law enforcement um, uh, capabilities as it would relate to finding missing children, or, or particularly on the exploitation. Uh, and as it relates to a lot of the cyber child pornography right. and right. that type of thing is, yeah. is, is quite often what they're most interested in. Uh, I was going to comment a moment ago, too, when you mentioned about back pages to go to that for a minute. But I think ironically, uh, I would find a little bit of humor in this, but I think if, it's, if there's a contempt of court uh, issue, uh, uh, order issued, that the U.S. Marshals would be the ones to go... Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Go get this guy. So I, um, I want to ride along. I'm just saying. Yeah. I want to go on that uh, that expedition. Um, uh, tell me what what uh, you are seeing, and if you can comment from not just a national level but a worldwide issue, um, the misconceptions that people and governments and countries have about child trafficking, particularly child hum human trafficking. Yeah, in some cases, uh, there's a blind eye to it. They want to make believe it's not happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's true even in some places in America here. I think we, we can say, because we don't see it and it's not necessarily noticeable, we can think that it's not as prevalent or as pronounced as it is. So one thing is, uh, you know, just that whole awareness of making sure people understand that it is, a, and this is one of the great things your institute is doing, is raising that level uh, of, of awareness. So, you know, as we think about going forward, you think about, you know, how can we take uh, the message of this particular issue uh, into the communities, into homes, and have people understand uh, the size and complexity of it? And that's on a worldwide message, which mm -hmm. makes it a little bit more difficult. Yet we're, we're trying to use those platforms that we can to be a voice. So one of the, one of the uh, challenges and, and, and certain goals that I have is to be, uh, uh, have our center be the voice and be the advocate for uh, those who are being exploited. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of us need a voice and an advocate, a cheerleader, somebody who cares, somebody who's going to do something about it. And uh, so I have the um, uh, sort of the honor and distinction on one hand of being at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, 
But some days I can say if there's anything that does take the wind out of my sails or depress me a little bit, it's the scope and magnitude about what we see. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have seen instances, for example, where uh, the image of a, of a child can be um, uh, put online, an ad can be put online, and instantaneously, within milliseconds, uh, the, the, the picture starts being uh, distribu distri distributed, uh, as well as, uh, as, in the case of Backpage or putting up ads, the moment an ad goes up, uh, the phone starts ringing. So the size and complexity is sort of a goal of mine mm -hmm. is to try to uh, keep this awareness and keep this pressure, keep this focus on it so that we can do something about it. Good. Um, uh, I went in, I do, I do this on a yearly basis. I go in and talk to the editorial board of the Arizona Republic. Uh, not a large newspaper by, in, by any stretch, but you know we're a decent sized community. And I always rather thought that we were somewhat progressive, you know, that we had our, at least had our eye on things and, and you know, did a few things, you know, at least knew what was going on. And the same, I pose this question every year when I go in so they know it's coming. Um, I said, because when I grew up, I was born and raised in Arizona. I, when I, growing up there, when a person was arrested for soliciting prostitution or something like that, their picture was automatically put in the newspaper. And I remembered as a child, because my, you know, my mom would say, you know, these guys are really bad and this is what's going on. That's, they don't do that anymore. So my question to them was, why don't you, pub growing up, you all used to publish the news pictures in the newspaper. And I kid you not, the publisher of the newspaper, and I have a witness here that was with me both times when I asked the question, said, oh, they might get hurt. Their families might hurt these men. And I said, as opposed to them hurting a child. I mean, and so it, I thought we'd made great progress in Arizona, and we just took two steps forward in that conversation, or two steps backwards in that conversation. How do we change the conception of the customer that these guys, it's not boys will be boys. Right. Uh, you know, the whole idea that, that somehow this is okay, you know. Sure, sure. Uh, shame or humiliation probably is, a, is, a, is not necessarily a bad tool. I mean, I if agree. you think about uh, <laughs> uh, the whole issue of, uh, of what's being done in those situations with minor children, uh, and I guess it, it would then boil down to what does uh, a particular uh, uh, journalism or, or venue have a stomach for, what they would do to actually publish mm -hmm. or... Uh, explain or show the the more dark side uh, or or who these actual actors are or who these uh, individuals who are uh, procuring and buying uh, minor children for sale mm -hmm. who are they and so putting their picture yeah. out may not uh, necessarily be a bad idea so. clearly someone disagrees <laughs> Um, yeah. I, I think it's time to take questions. Is this? Am I correct on this? <laughs> I, th I saw someone wave a thing. Am I right? Is it time for questions? Okay, I'm sorry. I can't see the cards very well. So uh, we do have people out there with microphones. Can we? Anyone? If you'd like to ask our guest a question, please do or me. But, uh, over here. There's one here. Give it a few. Please introduce yourself. Ken Meyer, Gord. Um, who is the most prominent person in terms of public power who has ever been caught in child sex trafficking? Wow. Um, <laughs> Alphabetically uh, or in order of importance? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I don't have any names at the top of my head. Of course, in my... In, in my, um, in my three months at the center, uh, I have not had the, I guess, the, uh, the research yet to actually look at you know, who, who I could name and say is the most prominent person. Uh, I, w I would suppose if you were to uh, go in any particular jurisdiction and, and uh, impose that question just uh, online, you'd probably find major cases, major offenses. U.S. Attorney's offices, of course, make press releases on these types of things. Uh, that would indicate who some of the more uh, uh, visible or prominent uh, individuals are. But uh, I, I just can't think of somebody off 
top of my head regretfully. That's what, that's what the uh, 28 years in the federal government did to me. It, you, know. you know, in my opinion, uh, it's not necessarily a person, although I'll name one, but it's the country of Nigeria right now. Um, the former president, good luck Jonathan, simply let Boko Haram run with those kids. And these, we know the kids have been distributed all over the world now. And he didn't do anything. He never stopped him, never fought him, never did anything. So I find him one of the most contemptuous people I've ever read about. I, I don't know him or anything. But I, ha, and and the, the inability for the rest of the world to even say something. I mean, we all held up signs that said, bring back our girls. But nobody, nobody stopped this guy. Nobody said, go find him. Fend for your country here. That's a good point. Uh, so anyway, that to me was outrageous. It's not maybe not a good answer to your question, but uh, another question, anyone? There's one here. Yes, ma'am. Come here. Um, I first got interested in this issue when I did a paper on it, and I, I mean, I was like over 50 years old. I had no idea the horrors some of these girls go through, and guys too. And uh, the seasoning, the tattooing, the things like this. Um, and I wondered if, um, kind of along your idea about the pictures, but if even preemptively people could be made aware, because I don't think most people know of the total horror of what's done to some of these girls, especially the ones who maybe aren't the prettiest. Um, and the second thing is, um, and, and I heard you talk yesterday on the, um, at the, you know, Congress, mm -hmm. and uh, when you spoke about the customers and um, also about raising awareness, and with the police, um, do they have enough awareness? Because my experience is like, if a child's a runaway, they kind of like wait to 18 hours and figure they had a fight with their family and stuff like this, and in the meanwhile, terrible things could happen to them. Mm -hmm. So could you address those two things? Yes. Sure. Uh, well, for example, we are doing a lot of training with law enforcement right now to recognize uh, signs or uh, particular uh, things about um, what they might see if they go into a home, for example, or if they're on a traffic stop and they see uh, certain things in a car, a, a child, minor child in the back seat, uh, certain things that the driver uh, may be doing that could indicate that that's not necessarily a uh, uh, a friend of, the, uh, of that child or parent uh, or, or somebody in a proper custodial situation. So we're training a lot of law enforcement to become more aware. Uh, in fact, at our center, we have uh, uh, hundreds of officers every year, uh, law enforcement going through to be trained in uh, how to be more sort of aware of the kinds of things that you're, uh, you're pointing out. Um, you know, some of the other uh, sort of public policy issues that we're trying to look at is it uh, from the center as it relates to uh, highlighting this. We know a uh, young child, they're groomed. Uh, they, they are uh, taken at particularly points of high vulnerability. That's why there's a, a few years ago, for example, it's about one out of every six runaways had ended up in some type of sex trafficking situation. In more recent times, it's one out of every five. So it's you know, it's starting to uh, become a, a more prominent, more pronounced uh, situation. But uh, all of that begins through this whole process of taking those who are vulnerable. And as it was pointed out earlier, to, to note that they're not uh, uh, child prostitutes. This is, they're, they're true victims. They're, these aren't willing participants in this process. If, if I can say also, there's something that we're testing and I think we're, I think it's going to be implemented in a few more schools in Arizona but it's working with elementary and high school boys talking about respect respecting little girls respecting women respecting and I don't often think particularly the at-risk communities are not not getting that kind of message from from home if they if they're even in home uh, at all so beginning with the basics that it is not okay to hit or hurt or abuse a little girl or a little boy, but just the basic concept of respect. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that we as a community felt that was very important to try to instill in our children at a very young age. Um, it's a message you think we get at home, but that doesn't happen all the time. Um, and one more question. There, right there. Um, hi, my name is Blake Osborne. Um, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, 
and uh, my city has one of the unfortunate distinctions of being one of the largest uh, hubs, unfortunately. And I read a report once that part of the difficulty in this issue is the inequality due to the law in the sense that law enforcement is trained to look for prostitution and it's easier to arrest people for prostitution than to arrest, for lack of a better term, the Johns themselves. So I was wondering, is there any action you know of or going on in Congress to combat that? Uh, I, I don't know that there's uh, current uh, activities within Congress to combat that. I think a lot of uh, the local jurisdictions and some of the state jurisdictions have been taking a, a look at that. Um, and, and probably if you went state by state and looked at some of the uh, laws and the way they're structuring now about more identifying uh, who are those individuals who are purchasing, going out to buy, uh, to look and seek uh, the minor children for sex, uh, uh, that, that, that those laws are probably stronger. Um, but I, I'm not aware on the federal level what efforts might be done to, to increase that. The, there's a, a, a number of NGOs, as you know, that are working on just that. It's, again, beginning with the basics. Uh, it's about changing the language. Uh, from prostitute to victim. It's about enabling communities, and so, such a, as what we've done, but other states have done in a beautiful way as well, in offering services so that that child, when picked up, uh, you know, in the situation that they're in, does not wind up in jail, but winds up someplace safe where services can be offered and where they can, can seek treatment as well. Um, it, it's, so, it's such a spider web of problems and issues, but it begins with a change of language and a change of understanding. And we, you know, we have a very rural community out west and, you know, the, most of our law enforcement looked at these little girls as being prostitutes. You know, oh, they want it. They're there because they, you know, it's fine. We got to have that. And that's not what this is. And so what we've been trying to do is really deeply change the whole attitude and educate them, make it part of their police process and their training process in both the academy and then ongoing training. It's a long process, though, and, but it does begin with the very basics. And you have some good stuff going on, though. Delta Airlines, by the way, is outstanding on this issue. They're just, in my opinion. We have, yes. I'm sorry to talk too much, but uh, they're amazing. <laughs> they really are. Um, oh, I, can we take one more? OK. One, yes, ma'am, right there, red jacket. Sorry about that. Hello, I was wondering, you, it was earlier mentioned the fact that once upon a time, domestic violence was not considered domestic violence. And that was a change in definition. So earlier you mentioned that the number has, of, I believe it was children being trafficked has gone from one in six to one in five. Do you think that is partially due to the change in definition of what is considered human trafficking and sex trafficking? Or do you think it has more to do with the actual increase in those being trafficked? Uh, it's probably a combination of the two, I would say. Uh, sadly, I think there's an increase in the number of those being trafficked. Uh, but because of awareness uh, and the fact that we are now uh, coming to, I think, stronger grips with this problem, uh, identifying it as a problem, uh, exposing it, uh, talking about it, debating it, and having forums like this, uh, I, I think that there's a, that awareness is making it um, uh, maybe, maybe changing a definition of sorts, but bringing uh, the public into the, uh, the whole discussion uh, to understand it at its true depth and meaning. So, uh, so that, that is, uh, I, I think, part of what's going on. Well, I was just given this sign. I know what that means <laughs> over here. Um, I certainly want to thank you for coming and being a part of this. Uh, one last thing, if you wouldn't mind telling uh, our audience, how can they get involved? If they're not already involved, how can they get involved? Sure. Uh, we've got some great resources at the center. Um, you know, if you go to missingkids.org and you look on there, you've got youngsters that want to learn about how to safe, safely surf the web. We have NetSmarts, and that's the program that's out in all the schools. Uh, you know, we've got a, a lot of um, uh, resources at our disposal that we can help you with. We've got family advocacy uh, group that will help uh, those who are rescued and found to be victims. 
Uh, so there's a whole bunch of resources that we can certainly give to you. Uh, stay involved, stay aware, uh, talk to your, uh, your circle of friends about this issue. Uh, make sure that they know, you know what, what it is and that it is real, it's not just imagined, and, and get them involved in this whole movement. As I said when I started, I, I love to be in a room full of fighters, and you're obviously here because you want to hear about this topic, and you, I, I believe you want to do something about it. So spread that, uh, talk to others, and, and we can uh, collectively, collaboratively do something about it because single-handedly, it's a, it's a mountain to try to overcome. Thank you so much. And uh, we, I hope that you'll come back and join us another time. Love to. Again, thank you for the, the great honor of being here.